Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would help us to understand the word that we have this morning. We thank you for all people that are listening, Lord, by live stream, by Facebook Live. But Lord, you've brought us together and you've brought us here. And we need your word as only you can make it come alive on the inside of us so that we would apply it to our lives. Father God, as you're instructing us. Father, we're rejoicing for the life you've given us, for the opportunities you've given us. And Father, we're we're committed to be your disciples. And in Jesus' mighty name, we all agree and say, Amen. Amen. Now, you know, I want to say, I want to begin this new series. Of course, you would probably think that he's going to be talking about amazing grace. I will in time, but this morning I kind of want to unpack something a little different. And the subtitle will be to this, God Only Knows. Everyone say, God Only Knows. And I'll explain it, what, uh, what I mean by that as I go along. But... But being called to be a disciple of Jesus without any doubt is a calling to live an amazing life. Can I have an amen? amen. And every born-again believer in Christ Jesus, of course, is a disciple. There's no such thing as being a Christian without being a disciple. Can I have another amen? amen. I'm going to have to help you this morning, okay? And uh, so, therefore, every child of God has been predestined in Christ to be a disciple, therefore, to live an amazing life. Say amazing. amazing. My point is this morning is simply this. God has an amazing plan for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has an amazing plan for you. <laughs> now, I know some of us might have said it out of road, and I really appreciate you uh, going through that exercise, but sometimes we don't tend to believe that we have an amazing plan because of places we have been at, things that have gone on, or things that we have done, and yet, we all agree it's a nice idea for maybe somebody else. God once told Joshua, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And I've often said over the last couple of years that God will do the amazing when we do the surrender. Say, God will do the amazing when we do the surrender. Consecration simply means to set yourself apart. And you know, essentially when you and I become believers, we're setting ourselves apart from the world system. We're setting ourselves apart from our way of doing life to his way of doing life. Amen? But in that setting yourself apart, or the day that you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you were surrendering your will, you were surrendering your life to the, to the degree that you understood it at that moment. It still was an act of surrender, and that opened and flung open the doors for you and I to step into the opportunity of living an amazing life. Turn your neighbor and say, you're still amazing. amazing. You know, I, um, I want to share some things that, again, while I was in Yokohama, Japan, you know, I kind of, I came across a couple of things, and one of the things I want to share with you right now is this thought that if a person had missed the mark, I was thinking, if a person misses the mark, they tend to believe that they can never get back to the place that they once had so clear before them prior to missing that mark. And I thought, if they only knew what God knows versus what they think they know about God, because God knew everything that we were ever going to go through and knows exactly what we would forever need in those moments when we don't know or are not too clear about our future. Only God knows. Say, only God knows. A big key to living God's amazing life, though, is to live the surrendered life. To live the surrendered life is to surrender yourself to what God knows versus what you think you know about yourself or what you think you know how things are gonna work out. This is the beauty, the best of your life is living the surrendered life. The best of your life will be to living the surrendered life. And, and the Bible is clear where we've been talking for the last couple of weeks, especially in the series called The Surrendered Life. We were talking about that we are to continue to surrender. We continue to walk surrendered to the extravagant love of Christ as Jesus Christ surrendered his life for all of us. You know, it's, it's good on paper 
it's good when we're in this kind of environment. But when we get to that place where things have gotten a little dark, when we've crossed a line that we know we shouldn't have crossed, or maybe something was imposed upon us, or however it happened, however we got tricked into it, fallen into it, we're not asking how we got there. It's not so much how we got there. Is that even people that call themselves believers, Christians, don't believe they can get out of there. I mean, not really. Not to the degree that they once were so confident that they had before them. So this is what it means to surrender our lives. And I want to kind of unpack that a little bit more for you. You know, Corey Ten Boone, she was a missionary prior to many people who uh, probably even know her name, once said, never be afraid uh, to trust an unknown future to a known God. You know, and I love that. And I want you to understand that when we miss the mark and we hit this place, we really have a difficulty, even though we can kind of come up with intellectual, logical, reasonable, even maybe regurgitate some things that maybe we've learned in our church entity experience, you know, our churchy experience. So many Christians so so much about God, but they've never experienced the God that they say they know. So many people talk about a Jesus that they don't know. That's why they don't talk much about him. You know, but Jesus is not a philosophy, a theory, an idea, an icon. You know, he is a person. And you cannot talk about the love of God without talking about the person of who Jesus is. He just wants you to just know about him. You need to experience him or you're going to get to a place where the enemy will bang you up so much and fill you with arguments emotionally trying to keep you down because sometimes you and I we don't know in terms of when I say no the kind of knowledge we ought to have the revelation the understanding the mm, not just the intellectual or the logos of the word but the but the the rhema of the word the revelation where you just know because you know because you know because you've experienced the very presence of God can someone say amen or not you see, because we all need to know, every one of us in this room, that God is a restorer, God is a rebuilder, and God is a relauncher. Amen? It would say God restores, God rebuilds, and God relaunches. Nobody wants to make a mistake, and I'm not here to glorify mistakes. I'm here to glorify the one who can take us out of the pit of mistakes. But I want you to realize that the adversary is threatened by our lives. And I want you to understand that the key is surrender. Remember uh, a number of weeks ago I shared something from Job chapter 11 where not only does it talk about the word surrender but it talks about the benefits that happen when we surrender our lives. The amazing benefits. Yet some people just never come to that point of just trusting God and say, Lord God, regardless of how I feel, you know, regardless of how things look, regardless about the arguments that the adversary is wanting me to take upon, I'm going to surrender to what your word says. In essence, I'm just coming focus on this. I'm going to surrender, we ought to say, to your love, to your extravagance, that you would love me so much, that's so beyond my logic, beyond my reason, that you would love me so much to restore me, to rebuild me, and to relaunch me. So in Job chapter 11, it says, surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer. Give up your sins, even those you do in secret. Then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge. And your darkest night will be brighter than noon. You will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. You will sleep without fear and be greatly respected. <coughs> Excuse me again. Imagine the, the reality if you've ever gotten to a place where you've, quote, unquote, missed the mark. 
or something has happened, or you failed, or you were defeated in some area, that you could ever get back to the place of no shame, of bold confidence, of living fearless, you know, or living without the burden or the troubles, as it says here, or getting out of the darkest of the night of that situation, or finding again the rest, the safety, and the security, you know, not having to live by the worry, and living without, again, fear, and being respected again. I said, Pastor Robert, no, you, there are some people that just cross that line and they can never get back. That's because you don't know. You don't know the restoration power, the rebuilding power, the forgiveness, the goodness, the mercy, the grace of God. It's not just a word that we use on a Sunday morning, but it's something that you personally have to learn to experience to have that resurrection life. Come on, somebody. That's why it says, continue to walk surrendered to the extravagant love of Christ. For Jesus surrendered his life as a sacrifice because of what he did, not because of what you do. And there's so many Christians that live with legalistic mentalities. They live like they're under the law. The moment they make a mistake, God somehow casts him out and will have nothing to do with him. Or if he ever does, it will be on a lower level, you know. No, I'm not giving sin a pass whatsoever. Sin will destroy your life. ¿Me entienden? Do you understand? It's so important. But you need to understand, God forbid that any of us ever get to any level of missing the mark, but you need to understand you're never going to be restored because of your great wits, your skill set, your talent, your gifting, you know, your, your knowledge base. It will be by having a humble, broken, and contrite heart to the only one who can lift you up as you and I surrender. But when he does, he doesn't compound you with guilt and condemnation and shame. He lifts you out of the darkness and he says, I got an amazing plan for your life. Most people lose the desire, the, the, the fight, the fire to live out that amazing plan for their life because they've tripped up, you know. And I would like to talk to you this morning about some things that will, will help us to understand um, this, why this is important as I kind of lay out the, the, the beginning of this. Because <clears throat> to walk surrendered to his extravagant love is the only way to live a surrendered life is the only way you're going to keep yourself out of what I'm just going to fast forward here. Eventual bitterness, resentment, dread, and regret. And the, the idea that you will start coming out with plans for your own life versus God's plan for your life. It's, and it's not that you'll necessarily move away from God or move out of the church but there's a lot of people that disconnect and don't believe that they can really live out God's amazing plan because of something that they've fallen short of, something that has not been achieved. And, and life is interesting. And most people don't understand sometimes how the adversary wants to keep you back. And the only way he can is by deception. And the battlefield that often rages is in your own mind. The arguments that you have that must be cast down and covered by the blood of Jesus. The victory does not come on your own strength. The victory comes in your humility to surrender to him. He is the only one who can lift you to areas and launch you to places that you can never even imagine you, would, you can even get a hold of. If not but for the grace and the mercy of God. And I say this and I'll probably repeat it again. Remember these two things about grace and mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, God's judgment. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, God's goodness. Come on, somebody. Say, I'm a product of God's mercy and God's grace. But I want you to understand that, you know, it, to walk surrendered um, to his extravagant love, this is where the adversary oftentimes fights a person and the biggest fight that the adversary will bring in your life through the arguments and the thoughts 
you know, it's where he'll tempt you the most to walk away from God. It's where all the arguments for your restoration will be mocked by little, these little like, yeah, right, kind of statements that we kind of come up with in ourselves. It's where if you don't surrender, the ultimate outcome will eventually be a bitterness against Christ and his church. A distrust and resentment will come in. And then this is where your carnal mind begins in desperate, anxious ways to produce actions to take over where God used to have control of. And I want you to realize the enemy is just trying to get you and I and any believer to reject God's amazing life for what God has prepared for every life. He wants you and I to walk away. That's why there may be times, and I've been there myself, where, not because of sin, just want to make that clear, but there have been things that have happened that, I mean, things got pretty gloomy, pretty dark, pretty dreary, and it did look like, man, is, am I ever going to see daylight in this thing? And sometimes it went for a season, but for what God's word said that he would restore. And sometimes you get to this place that you almost feel like you have no feelings or no, no sensibilities on certain things. But for what God's word says, you know, that he would restore, that he would rebuild, that he would relaunch. I'm just using that word relaunch, um, meaning to, to revitalize is another way you can say it. So let me share with you. Three important things I want you to consider this morning as we talk about this, this amazing life plan that God has for you, okay? Number one, you need to know <clears throat> whose plan you're following, first and foremost. Most people think that every desire in their heart is a God desire for their heart. Mm -hmm. But remember, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, Implied there are not plans to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Say, God's on my side. <laughs> now, by nature, by our human nature, we are all planners, aren't we? Well, let me kind of help you understand this. We all want to know, don't we, what's the plan? You go out with your friends, what's the plan? You know, you know you're going to go out to, you're, you're playing some sports, whatever. What's the plan? You know, you're going for the victory. You're never going for the defeat, right? But anyways, you know, what's the direction? Or, you know, how are things going to turn out? You always want to know, innately, you always want to know what the plan is. On a smaller scale, we're all planners. We all maybe, you know, what are we going to eat for dinner tonight? Or what am I going to wear to that great event that we're going to go to for our church or our company, whatever it might be, you know? And uh, there are big plans. There are little plans. And uh, down the road or later today, at some level, you're kind of always planning. Now, there are some people who take planning to a whole nother level. Yeah, you might be one of them, so kind of hold on to the rails right now. I mean, these people kind of plan out the next 10, 15 years for their life, you know. They got every duck in order. Even the ducks that don't want to get in order are in order. You know, they have a career plan, what kind of... They have planned out what kind of house they want. They'll take nothing less. They'll plan out how, who they're going to marry. They're going to plan out how many kids they're going to have. You know, they're going to plan out, you know, their, their income. They're going to plan out uh, their investment games. They're going to plan out the relationships. You have this kind of relationship with these, but not with that. They really, you know, nothing's left to chance because they are such aggressive planners. You know, others are more flexible. Yeah. They, they have a plan, too, like, one or two week out maybe maybe you'll get a year out of them maybe you know and they uh they have hopes and they have dreams too they just don't have a timetable to fulfill them they're more chill they're more laid back they're a little bit more relaxed they have a budget but their budget is more like a guideline <laughs> you know they have a, a career plan well if it works out Basically, they're more of, let's wait and see what happens, and then we'll go from there. Now, um, we have people who are long-term planners and people that are short-term planners, and we're all kind of maybe in the mix. And I'm not taking anything away, as you'll, you'll hear by the end of this. Uh, but there's a warning I want you to understand. Your plans, you hear what I'm saying? Your plans are always flawed. I know that was exciting to hear, right? No matter how hard you've worked on it or how foolproof you think it is, there will always 
be some kind of hiccup, opportunity, or mishap. Because we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Doesn't mean you don't plan. Planning is important. But I want you to realize you can outplan the Holy Ghost. And a lot of people are notorious of being so good with their financial plans that God couldn't talk to them if he showed up and visited them in person. They would say, no, I'm not going to budge. This is the plan I have, and I got a plan. You know, I was talking to a person that was about ready to get married, you know, and I had uh, actually, uh, and, yeah, wait a minute, don't be talking, girl. <laughs> That's my Lexi. My, my Lexi's taking over for my second Holy Ghost. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And, uh, and so, you know, and they, they like, I got to get this financial thing together, got this financial thing together, and I got to get all this money before we get married. I said, that's a, that's a great plan. I said, but where does God fit in? Well, of well, that's what we're doing. We're going to have this great guy. Yeah, but what if God asks you to sow that money that you so diligently saved because you're making it your idol, your Isaac? So what if he said, I want you to sow it into something that's worthy and you know is God? Would you do it? Could you do it? Some people plan, but they don't plan to have any flexibility. And this little statement goes, blessed are the, uh, the flexible, for they shall not break. But there's some people that are broken because they're not flexible. Don't look at your neighbor right now. Just keep looking straight at me. It'll be all good. And, and, um, and here's what God says about his amazing plan for your life. He says, go ahead. Proverbs 16, 1 and 3 in the passage translation. It says, go ahead. Make all the plans you want. But it's the Lord who will ultimately direct your steps. We all, we are all in love with our own opinion. Everyone say true. I know, right? Okay. We're all in love with our own opinions, convinced they're correct. But the Lord is in the midst of us, testing and probing our every motive. Before you do anything, put your trust totally in God and not in yourself. Then every plan you make will succeed. See, there's... Only so much happiness your plan will bring to you. And the big problem about planning without the Holy Spirit or planning, I'm, I'm talking about people who, who are committed Christians, but they plan with no God in the middle. Hear what I'm saying. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean that you're planning with God the center of it all. God, I know who I want to marry and I'm not going to marry anybody else. Mm, amazing. I'm going to have a moment to myself here. Hallelujah. Hey. And so the thing is, there are human limitations. See, we don't know the challenges or the opportunities that are going to pop up. It's good to plan. I'm not taking anything away from planning. But you have to understand there will be challenges. There will be opportunities. That God will bring along your, sorry, not the challenges, but the opportunities. And we don't know the decisions that people around us that we sometimes become too dependent upon. We become what's called codependent on people. We don't know the decisions. You think you know the decisions, but you know yourself. How many of you are in this room? You're like, you've planned this and then you change your mind. I mean, I just think of my girls. I mean, they change like five times before they walk out of their own room. And, uh, and they're, look, they're always looking great, but I mean, it's just like, dang, girl. You know, anyways, um, that was Hebrew for a while. Anyways, um, and then you don't even know. Look at, at the few years that we've been around. Look how quickly the world has changed in the most positive and innovative way. I mean, things are changing so much. Have you, have you planned back in whatever years it was where we are today with the advancement that we've had in a such a short amount of time. Now, all I'm simply saying is there are many variables that can alter our plans and transitions is, is part of life. There has to be transitions. But some people, their world gets rocked as soon as something doesn't work out the way they want it to work out the way they've planned. The big key that I'm trying to get you to understand is trust. Can anyone say trust? trust? It's only when you and I submit 
you, our plans to God that we begin to love the life that we have. So many people don't love the life they have. They tolerate the life they have. They put up with it. They kind of just struggle through it, but they don't love the life they have. I heard, um, I think it was Gloria Salamanca, and she's made this statement talking to Coley Branson, Natty, and, and Lexi there, and, and uh, I think it was in Bogota, and they were having, and they happened to record it, having some lunch, and she said something that literally gripped me, and this was about three, two and a half years ago, literally gripped me. She says, I love the life that I have, and I love who Jesus made me to be. You know, at that point, I never quite said it that way or thought it, about it that way. I never has said, at the, that point, I never said to myself, I love who Christ has made me to be. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm a driven person, and, and, and you know, and I, it's just the kind of makeup I kind of have to myself, and people have different personalities, that's all fine, and they all work, <clears throat> but the point is, me, I'm always like pushing for the next level, going for the next thing, kind of going down. I've had to learn to really taper that with the Holy Ghost. I mean, a real intervention, encounter, and that's just called Pastor Cesar. But anyways, but the, what I'm trying to share with you is that um, always was that way, and it was never quite satisfied. No matter what I did, I was just on to the next, on to the next, and on to the next. Almost not, never enjoying the moment, and almost never, no matter what it is that God was doing, I was just like always wanting to reprove even that. And, um, but when, when Pastora Gloria said that, you know, I love who Christ made me to be, it just had me, it's not that I hadn't thought about that, but it's just never quite saw it that way, you know. I was appreciative, I was thankful, but I never said it, I love who Jesus made me to be. And I just really had to kind of reflect. See, I want you to know this, that God's plan for our life is better than our own plan for our life. Yet sometimes we think the plans we come up with are the best plans that there could ever be. Okay, thank you for the rip roaring. <laughs> but what's incur what I want you to be encouraged about is that God sees our end from our beginning or from the beginning because He has an amazing plan for our life. There's nothing that you will ever go through that surprises God. God does not get up in the morning because he never sleeps or slumbers. But God does not get up and say, you know, I'm so, I'm so concerned of how I'm going to get my people through this day because there are so many complications. Nothing concerns God in that sense. You have to understand, he is omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And he is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at the same time, and there's never a place that he is not. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In Hebrews chapter 13, I believe it's verse 5 in the Amplified, says, I will never, 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 never fail you. But he's with you. Even when we don't make the best choices, the best decisions, he's there to pick us up if we'll live with a surrendered life. Amen? Amen. And I want us to know th these kind of things. Here's what I want you to never forget. Regardless of the situation or the outward circumstance. God has an amazing plan for your life. There will be times where it looks like it's not. There will be times where you'll begin to question how things are working out. Is God coming through? Is he even around? Does he even know my, my email address? Does he know my Instagram? Come on, somebody. You know, does he know how to reach me? You know, so you kind of post up in every dimension so just to make sure that he got it all. But he is faithfully putting that plan in place right now. He's faithfully, his plan has not deviated. You know, he knows your longings, he knows our desires, but he does not forsake his people. See, when you realize that God is in control, say God is in control. Even when you think you're not in control, well, certainly, even when things don't look like they're in control, it takes the pressure off of us. You can't live by pressure. You should live by a press towards God's peace, but not by pressure. And the Bible says within your, within your heart, you can make plans for your future, but the Lord chooses the steps you take to get there. His commitment is not what you think your plan ought to be. It's what his plan is for your life. But there's no question that he has an amazing plan for your life. See, if you, if you let 
if you live lock-brained, if there's such a word, locked brain, your brain is locked. <laughs> it's like concrete, all mixed up and too well set. You'll catch that one on Monday morning. Uh, that really means. Uh, uh. Okay, anyways, uh, you know, see, we make these plans of how we want it and when we want it. But God wants us to walk by faith, trusting in Him, meaning living the surrender life. Because He chooses the steps. He will guide. All we have to do is learn to live obedient. Ay, perdón, you guys are taking too much time. Number two, second thought, I just got to move on. Don't poison the present with the past. The second thing you need to understand about God's amazing, don't poison your present with the past. I like what Thomas Jefferson once said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Also what George Eliot once said, he says, it's never too late to be what you might have been. I want everyone to find encouragement in that. You know, the worst, the worst poison venom, contamination for your life is the poison of the past. We end up with victim mentality, with regrets, and with dread. God has never called us to be a victim to our past, yet so many people are. They live by regret. Had I not done that, had I not made that decision, have I not had that situation happen, and the list goes on. I remind you that God's committed to the amazing plan for your life. Again, Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you. Sometimes, not God's doing, sometimes things don't work out because it was your plan to begin with, not his plan. And we get ourselves in situations that are, can be mm, sketchy at, at best. But in order to experience what God wants to do in your life, you have to let God heal you of past poisons. You know, I think of people, for example, like Abraham and Sarah, when they failed trying to help God out, you know, with, you know, um, you know, having a child, they ended up with an Ishmael. And that the pain of an Ishmael, the poison of a past mistake, you know, could have stunted them, except, you know, God said, no. You have a great future ahead of you. Then there's Moses who took matters into his own hands and wanted to become the redeemer before his time, so to speak, you know, to help Israel. And so he ended up killing a man. He ended up being a fugitive, a runaway, and uh, a man who was wanted dead, more dead than alive by Egypt. And so, you know, for 40 years he, looked, he lived on the backside of the desert till God showed up in a burning bush and says, I, gotta, I still have a future for you. Then there's somebody like David who committed adultery as the king of Israel and had Bathsheba's husband killed for his own self-centered lustful reasons, you know. And slowly the weight of the poison of that past was eating him up in silence until Nathan showed up, the prophet, and, and his future was growing bleaker and bleaker till he repented with a surrendered heart and God still had a future beyond his past mistakes. Then there's a young, a young, um, well, let me just jump. A young Peter who denied Jesus three times. And he wallowed in the poison of his past of denying something he said he'd never do. Jesus made it a point to let Peter know, you know, you still have a future with me. Showed up and he had a little fish barbecue thing going on there by the seashore. And, and then uh, there was a woman who was caught in adultery, you know. And they brought her to Jesus, and they were ready to stone her. And uh, she was tormented with the poison of her past. But Jesus offered her mercy and grace, giving her future and a hope. What I'm trying to share with you with those just few examples, Jesus, God has always worked, and Jesus works today. We make mistakes, but if you let the poison of your past become a contaminating venom, and you begin to ingest it, and you just relive it, you know, it's going to hurt your present. It's going to hinder your future. There is no pit so deep that Jesus cannot reach in and pull us out. Amen. Can I have a better amen than that? Amen. amen. So Paul said it this way. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
Another way I'd like to say it is God has an amazing plan for your future. And you see, I understand we all hit these moments. I've been there. You've been there. Maybe you're there this morning in some area. Maybe not, it's not sin, but something in the past is kind of is just kind of hanging. Or you're still living by a dread or a regret of something not working out. You have to let the poison of the past go. You can't change the past. So the enemy just wants you to kind of like an old movie, just kind of re rehearse it. And I'm here to tell you, you're not going to go in amnesia. But you are going to get free. You don't have to go to amnesia. You're not going to forget about it. But when God sets you free, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. See, what we may see as a dead end, God sees as a new beginning. And I close with this last thing. Surrender to his extravagant love. The three things. Know what plan you're following. Number two, don't let the poison of the past mistakes affect you. And number three, surrender to God's extravagant love. Here's why I want to leave this with you. I'm going to go a few more minutes. It's because God only knows. Because say, God only knows. There are things that God know, only knows that we don't know that he knows. But that he asks us to trust him in what he knows. And not to trust in just what you think you know. It's not a play on words. When you're feeling down and you're feeling bad. And so, can you move this please? Thank you. When you're feeling down and you're feeling bad, you tend to surmise your life with what you think you know. I get it. You know, we always try to conjure up where we're at by based on what we know. But you don't know the depth of God's love. I mean, as much as you think you know about God's love, you don't know the depth of it. The power and the depth of his forgiveness when there's a heart that repents or a heart that wants healing. God will do amazing things. There might be people that he'll forgive and he'll restore that you don't feel they're worthy for them to be forgiven or to be restored. But you're not the creator of humanity. That's just your knowledge base. The Bible says that we ought to forgive people if God has forgiven us. But the problem that some of us really have, we can grapple with the forgiving of others. The real difficulty that we have often, silently, is that we can't forgive ourselves. And we can't forgive ourselves. And so, only God knows. Only God really knows the depth of His love. And all He's asking you to do is to trust Him with all of your heart. And lean not to your knowledge base, your own understanding. Your opinion, though you have, it, you have a right to use it, is not the definition of God's forgiveness or of God's healing power. That the decisions they're making are the worst decisions they can make. But they're based on what they think they know that God can no longer do. I would say I only know that by discernment. But I know that. As real as the steps I'm standing on right now. And there's a number of people that have said, you know, I'm frustrated with my life. I'm fed up with my life, but because certain things and certain dark spots and certain elements that have kind of gone on in their life, they're now choosing to make other plans. And sometimes people tend to make other plans because they just don't think they can ever get back to the plan that God has for them. And I simply want to say, it's nothing but a lie from the pit of hell. God restores, God rebuilds, and God relaunches. Well, let's all stand to our feet if we would, please. You know, I'm thankful... Um, today, where I'm at, when I'm being referring, make, referring back to a point where I was at, I'm not going to go through that story because of time, but um, it does look like everything is spinning pretty fast out of control or absolutely a dead still silence, like nothing is moving and nothing is making sense. The Bible says, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not faint. They shall run and not be weary doesn't mean that we just kind of sit and bum around. It just means that we have faith in God that regardless of what we feel, don't feel, or don't see moving in our time, God is in control and he's working it. I don't have to feel something to know he's working on the amazing plan he has for my life. And I simply wanted this morning's message to be very simple. Um, I wanted to bring 
any person in this room the kind of hope that only Jesus Christ can give you. Even if you've only slightly, even if you've never talked about it with anyone, even, I'm not talking about things that are blatantly a sin. Sometimes we just hold on to things. And maybe it's been years that we've kind of moved away, but it's just kind of always lingering there, and it's just like I'm never free. Man, I used to live by such a terrible, all I can say is honestly, um, I don't know if you've ever felt dread or regret. I mean, it was not like I regretted things happening. I mean, it was just on me all the time. I was embittered on, on some things that, that I was swindled out of. You know, it could have been betrayal, it could have been rejection. All those things happened. But a couple of things that really happened. And, and, uh, but carrying the weight of that, I mean, I was constantly having to fight through that. But it wasn't until God says, well, how long are you going to carry this? I said, carry what? He didn't even know what he's talking about at the time. Because I, I went into this mode. Remember a couple of weeks ago? Sorry for those of you who were not around. But um, I said, God, you need to show me the arguments that I have in my life that I don't even know that I have in my life, but that are hindering what you want to do in my life. I just get used to thoughts. We all get used to thoughts. And one of the ones many years ago was you're carrying regret and dread. And he showed me what it was. And I said, he said, well, when are you, how long are you going to do that? I said, um, uh, you kind of like, I thought I'd like, you know, you kind of thought you kind of got rid of it, but it's like, it's always weighing on you. So obviously I didn't. Let me just simply say this fast forward right now. I still know everything that happened. It does not affect me emotionally. I am not embittered in any way. I am so free from all of that. I, all I mean is that's what I mean when you, you won't go into amnesia, but you will find your freedom. When you let God do what only he can do. Amen. So I want to encourage anyone here in this room. I know I came in with, with an assignment of restoration. Of, again, he restores, he rebuilds, and he relaunches. If somehow you've backed away from something, maybe confidence in yourself, maybe security in what God has for you. Maybe the fact that God has an amazing plan. Maybe you started downgrading, shrimp wrapping, wrapping your, your kind of life view now, changing your perspective from that, you know, extraordinary to that uh, kind of okay, bump along kind of life. I'm going to just tolerate life and just kind of hold out to the end. No, that's far from the kind of person God wants you to be. I'd like to just add our agreement with you and pray with you on any whatever level that might be on. Again, it might not be sin. It just might be something that happened. Maybe something was imposed upon you that, that you know, you never had, a, anyways, a choice in, but it happened. And here you are, and you're still carrying it. No more. Don't carry the poison of the past. God only knows. He knows that his love is all you need. So let's surrender to his love and say, God, here I am. To surrender means that you're going to give over. Give it over. Just give it over. God, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to give it over. It's all yours. I'm just going to trust you. I'm not going to try to be trying to figure things out, you know. I'm just here trusting you that you have an amazing plan for my life. And I'm not, never going to give up on that. No matter what it looks like, no matter who says what or who's said what or what's been done, I am not going to give up on your amazing plan because... I choose to surrender to your extravagant love. If that's you and you need prayer this morning, can I invite you to come forward up here on whatever? It could be career. It could be family. It could be your life. It could just be something that personally took place in your life. Just come now and, and just come forward. If we, and I can have my pastors and G12 leaders. And as I need them, some 144 leaders. We just want to take time. This is we're going to close off. No one's going to be called out in any way. But... If you're coming up as a couple, I ask you to come up and just hold hands so we know to pray for you as a couple. But I, I just love that song, How God Only Knows. And maybe some of you are not so much in a struggle with something that happened in the past. Maybe you're just struggling with, with trusting that God really knows more than you know. You know, He really knows more than you know. And I just want this to be a, an opportunity where God just kind of breathes encouragement into you. 144 leaders, if you're here, please come up. He just breathes encouragement into you. It's not because we're flawed, we're wrong, we're bad, we're, we're evil, we've done something wrong or sinful. Again, 
If that's the situation, then you can take care of it as you pray right now. But I don't think that's, I just seen too many people and I was really moved. I was just really moved in a, in a very emotional way with a particular person. If they're here, I'm glad they, would, I'm glad they are because they need to hear this. I think the decision they're making is a wrong decision. But I think the decision they need to make is a God decision. But there are people that truly believe that God cannot get them back to a place that they once had so clear in their sight to achieve because of things that they meant. They truly don't understand what God only knows about the power of his love. He wants us to know. He doesn't just want you to know about something. He wants you to experience. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We align ourselves with compassion, Father God, towards any and every person. We don't have to live by past poisons. We don't have to live by inflexible, premeditated plans. And certainly, Father God, we can choose to live surrendered to your extravagant love. Lord, there are so many things that you know that we don't know. Sometimes we've got our own knowledge base, what we think we knew or about you or about situations. Just take take precedence priority and dominate what we called our plans lord i pray this morning as we come we come surrendered no man no woman deserves to live father god in any kind of poison to their past you're much too merciful you've given us your grace and all came through the cross and we're here before you ever so thankful. Lord, I trust in you that every person that's going to be prayed for, that that prayer is going to have the right words to speak. Words of comfort, words of strength, words of deliverance. Father God, words of freedom. Because you're working. Lord, this is an assignment message for this morning. Because every now and then, Lord, you come in with such a breath to encourage your people. With such a a present willingness to lift people up because all they've been doing is just trudging and tolerating and, and pressing but Lord some of us have not loved the kind of life that we're living and you're going to change that you're going to do something in us today because whom the sun sets free is free indeed our trust is not in men, not in things, not even in ourselves. We know we have to walk by faith, but we're going to trust in you. So, Lord, thank you for your anointing this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. And, Lord, minister with great compassion now in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who are out here, just put your right hand over your heart, if you would please, for me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person that came this morning. I am ever so thankful for the opportunity to share amongst these, your people, Lord, what you're doing in their life. I'm asking, Father God, right now that you would restore hope. You would restore, Lord, give them all a confidence, a security, a knowing, a peace, Father God, that you know everything that's going on in their life. And Lord, if they have a friend that's troubled or a friend that's kind of given up, Father, I pray that you would reach out to them through them. Lord, but right now I pray for every person in this room that you would cover them. You would protect them. I claim soteria over their life. Peace, peace over every situation, their families, their marriages, their plans. And of course, Father God, your amazing plan for their life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.